Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today, I want to talk to you about temptation. Temptation is probably one of the most familiar experiences that we all experience. And I'm sure while some of us might be tempted more than others, no doubt all of us at one point in our life will be tempted. And we all know it's true. Jesus knew it was true. That's why he added it to our most popular prayer, lead us not into temptation. This year, we're studying the book of Matthew, and we spent a good amount of time on Jesus's birth through the holiday. And yesterday, we were introduced to John the Baptist. And the next big story in Matthew is Jesus's temptation in the desert. And I believe there's a great deal that we can learn from the temptation of Christ as we find it here in our text. And at first glance, you know, it might not be obvious because I think the story seems fantastic. It seems wonderful, it seems otherworldly, it seems like a fairy tale. I mean, it's a story between Jesus and the devil, but it is still a true story. And I think we can learn something here and we can certainly take something away for encouragement. Because like I said, temptation happens to everyone. It's, it's common to us all. But victory over temptation is probably not so common, especially now in January, as many people are wrestling with their New Year's resolutions and they're trying to do all these things that they hope will improve their lives. Those old ways, though, that are already so ingrained in us, those old habits, they tempt us to go back to the way things used to be, the way things were, because yeah, it's just easier, right? It's familiar. We know it. Just, just one more cookie. <laughs> just one more secret glance. Nobody will know. Nobody will care, and it, it feels good. So, you know, come on. But as we're about to see, right at the beginning of his own ministry, Jesus is tempted. Matthew 4 Verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Okay, so before we dive into this text and maybe extrapolate what it means for us, I think there's some good reminders here for uh, us to take in first. And I think the first uh, thing we should realize, the first truth is, there is a spiritual world. You know, we, we see the physical world, we live in it every day. But this is a good reminder that there is a spiritual world that is unseen. And I know we don't talk about heaven and hell and the devil and angels a whole lot, but that's more so because there isn't a lot about those subjects in the Bible. The Bible makes us keenly aware that there is a spiritual world, but it's not a world that we get a lot of details about. That said, we don't even know how this scenario plays out. Did the devil appear as a physical person and take some sort of physical shape? How did these temptations really take place? But even with that, it doesn't lessen the devil. He's still a real being that really exists. And we do know there is invisible and spiritual just like there is real and natural. Second, in that spiritual world, there is a spiritual war. 
There is a war, a spiritual battle that is continually going, which means there is a good side, a side of light, a side of truth, a side of love, a side of forgiveness, and then there is a side of darkness, a side of shadow and deceit and fear. Whether we see it or not, whether we believe it or not, it's happening to us and around us all the time. Ephesians 6 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So there's a war that's taking place between a good side and a dark side. But here's the thing. The difference between those two sides is huge, chiefly in that they are not equal. I think we always think that they're 50-50 or that they're locked in some sort of eternal uh, arm wrestling match. I think when we think of the powers of darkness and the authority that the devil has, we give them way too much credit. You've heard the old saying, yeah, the devil made me do it. Yeah, I don't know. You, you might have been tempted to do it, but nobody made you do it. You still made that choice. In fact, the devil only has the power and the authority that God gives him. Satan is on a leash. You can do, he, he can do nothing outside of the sovereign power of God. He can't do anything outside of God's permission. God is eternal. God has no beginning. Nobody made God, but God did make the devil. He is a created being, which means the devil is not all present. He can only be at one place at one time. The devil is also not all-knowing. He does not read your thoughts. And we know this from the book of Job. The book of Job teaches us a lot about the devil. In that book, the devil is allowed to tempt Job. God gives him permission and gives him parameters that the devil has to obey. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. That sounds bad right? Nobody wants to be harassed. But why is it being done? Why is Paul being harassed? Well, if you read the entire verse, it says, so to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. A messenger from the devil was tormenting him. Why? So that through this, Paul would learn the supremacy of God's strength and grace. So the devil doesn't just have free reign to do whatever he likes. Yes, the Bible calls him a roaring lion that can devour us. But compared to our God, he is a soft, purring house cat. So I said we're in a spiritual war. Do I believe that war is playing out even right now? Absolutely. Yes, I do. Is there evidence of that? How would I know? Well, firstly, the devil is the creator of division. Sin is division. Pitting side against side. Is our nation divided? Left versus right? White versus black? Male versus female? It seems like we see something about those topics every single day, right? Romans 16 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ with their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Christians should do everything they can to tear walls down. Because that's what Jesus did. Wherever the devil would build, build walls of division to keep us apart and to keep one group down, to keep one group oppressed, to keep one group silent, keep one group on the outside, Christians should do everything they can to destroy those walls. Matthew 5 says, blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they should be called the sons of God. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Second, the devil is also the creator of fear. Do you think people are afraid today? Fear is not a tool of God. There is nothing in the Bible that tells you to be afraid. Being afraid is the opposite of trusting in God. 2 Timothy 1 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 1 John 4 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And we, we do all of this to ourselves. It, this is a self-inflicted wound. The media that we watch, the things that we read, they keep us divided and they make us afraid. If after watching or reading something, you have become more fearful, then ask yourself, why was I watching this? Why was I reading this? Why do I listen to voices that make me afraid? Because if I were reading the Bible, and if this was my news, if the Bible was my truth, if I believed the Bible to be true, then we would not be divided. And we would not be afraid. Okay. Our setting is we live in a real world that has both the physical and the spiritual. And in that spiritual world, there is a spiritual war. So we go back to our passage in Matthew. And what do we see? Well, the first thing we see is Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the new Adam? Yes, how so? Well, if this is the beginning of Jesus' story, and it's also the beginning of the New Testament, then perhaps it's a perfect mirror to how the Old Testament begins. Right there at the beginning of the New Testament, what do we see? Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus is hungry and the devil tempts him with food. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall eat any of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. It's no coincidence. There's no coincidences in the Bible. Nothing happens by accident. Both Adam and Jesus are initially tempted to eat food outside of the will of God. For Adam, it was eating the fruit from the tree that he was forbidden to. For Jesus, it was using his power to turn stones into bread. And in both of their situations, their temptations begin with questioning God. Questioning God's plan. For Adam, the serpent's question, he says, did God really say that you couldn't eat this? For Jesus, the serpent doubts who Christ is. If you are the Son of God, why are you hungry? Jesus' story begins the same way that Adam's does. But the difference is, Adam's story is told as a cautionary tale. This is the story of what not to do. But here, Jesus is going to succeed where Adam failed. What else do we see? Jesus is the perfect Israelite. See, in the Old Testament, God's children were Israel. And they were wandering in the desert, and they were hungry. 
The Bible records that they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Here in Matthew, how many days is Jesus tested? 40, right? 40 days and nights. And he's hungry. He's fasting. Matthew 4, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, your Bible might have that phrase that Jesus just said, italicized, and you may have a little uh, asterisk or a note, and you could follow that note to the bottom of your page, and it would tell you where that quote came from. It would probably say it was Deuteronomy 8.3. In fact, the Bible is going to do this again in this same story. If you look at verse 7, Jesus says to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, where is he quoting from? If you follow that note to the bottom of the page, it's Deuteronomy 6, 16. You go to the last verse, verse 10. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What is the reference? Deuteronomy 6, 13. So three times Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. Remember, there is no coincidence in the Bible. Nothing happens by accident. It's always by design. So that should make you ask, what's so special about Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8? What's happening there? Well, all three of those passages are specifically about Israel wandering in the desert for 40 years, hungry. What do we say? Nothing happens by accident, right? God doesn't want you to miss this. God doesn't want you to miss this. The failure of the past, Adam's failure and Israel's failure, Jesus here right now corrects it. Jesus faces both of those temptations and he succeeds. He is triumphant. So how does the temptation of Jesus relate to me? And you might answer, yeah, it, it doesn't. These aren't temptations that I face. This story is otherworldly. I mean, well, for one, Jesus is perfect. Jesus is God. And so did the devil really even stand a chance? Probably not. Jesus just breezed through this trial. Jesus doesn't face the things that I face. So then he can't be tempted the way I am tempted because I'm human. Jesus is God. I understand how you might think that, but it's not true. Last week, we were talking about baptism, and we asked, why did Jesus get baptized? He was without sin. He didn't need to get baptized. But we have a king who leads by example, and he would never do anything or face anything or walk through anything. That He wouldn't make us do anything that he wouldn't do himself. So, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the Bible says that in every respect, how is Jesus tempted? In every respect, just as you are. In fact, here, Jesus is tempted three different ways. Ways that you and I are tempted every single day. It's true. You just got to dig a little deeper and look a little closer. I mean, first, Jesus is tempted to satisfy his desire. Come on. Don't tell me you've never been tempted to satisfy your desires. After fasting for 40 days, the Bible says Jesus is hungry, which is an understatement, right? 40 days, 40 days without food, I would eat my shoes. I, I'd be beyond starving. And the devil comes and tempts him to turn stones into bread and to eat. The devil says, if you really are the son of God, doesn't that mean that God's your dad? And if he's your dad, why doesn't he care about you? He's just leaving you down here hungry? Or, and don't you have magical powers yourself? I mean, use them. Turn these rocks into something to eat. Isn't that how you and I are tempted? 
Aren't we always tempted to do the thing that satisfies our immediate needs? It's this impulse, right? I have an urge and then I act on it. And then I'm rewarded. My brain releases endorphins and I'm happy and I'm like, ah, oh, thank you, brain. Right? Satisfying your desires makes you feel good. And acting on those, that's the sin. Feeling good is not a sin. No. It's when we are tempted to fulfill our desire outside of God's will. Every one of us has these desires. All of us have desires that God has, God has built naturally into us. Desires that are good. Physical desires, emotional desires, needs that our bodies have, cravings that our soul has. God created us with these things. But he's created them in such a way that we should seek out his will for how we fulfill them. That's the whole point of the Garden of Eden, right? God created Adam and Eve with a desire for food. And it was a good desire, nothing wrong with it. But he created hunger to be fulfilled according to his word. But the snake came and brought temptation. He says, hey, maybe this, maybe this apple isn't just an apple. Maybe there's a reason that God doesn't want you to have it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the beginning of conspiracy theories, right? This is where conspiracy theories come from. Th this rule that God made couldn't possibly be to protect you, couldn't possibly be to keep you safe. You know what I think it is? God made this rule to hold you back, to keep you from becoming everything that you could be. He's restricting you. Well, you know what you can do? You can show him, right? You can show him. Their hunger wasn't bad. Their desire to eat wasn't bad. But it's when you act on that desire outside of the will of God. It's no difference with sex. It's no different with money. Those things aren't bad. Having desire for those things aren't bad. It's when you act on them alone outside of God's plan that we sin. That's how darkness tempts us. It tempts us with something that's already my desire. But the difference is how I fulfill that desire. Most of the time, our temptations come to us because we want to be just like everybody else. Come on, do it. It's what everybody else is doing. All the cool kids smoke, all the cool kids drink, all the cool kids use cuss words. Why, why do you speed on the road? Everybody else speeds. <laughs> That's our rationale. That's our rationale for speeding because everybody else is doing it. How childish. James 4 says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Who wrote that? Who wrote the book of James? Jesus' brother, his own flesh and blood. I know you want to be like the world. I know you want to fit in, but that is not who you are. You are a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of God. It's going to be a battle. It's gonna be a battle that you fight every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. And it's the same battle that Jesus faced. You need to trust in the all-satisfying, all-encompassing will of God. That's what we learn from Jesus in this moment. That when Jesus was tempted, he didn't go off and tell God what to do. Instead, he told temptation where it could go. How else is Jesus tempted? Well, he was tempted to protect himself. Self-protection. Now, the temptation is probably hard for us to understand because we struggle with why is that enticing to tell Jesus to jump off of a tower, <laughs> right? Why, why would you do that? It, but it's the, it's the hypothetical. 
It's the hypothetical we ask our own children. Oh, your friends were doing it. Okay, if your friends were jumping off a bridge, would you do it? That's basically what the devil says. And see, by now, Jesus has already fought temptation with Scripture. So the devil adopts this same tactic, and the devil fires back with Scripture. He says, if you really are the Son of God, throw yourself down, and he will save you by sending angels. That's what the Bible says. And then he goes back to Deuteronomy, Jesus does, and Jesus says, well, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What does that mean, putting God to the test? Well, it's you asking God for proof. God, you say you're going to protect me. You say you're always going to be with me. Prove it. God, if you're real, if your promises are real, prove it. Prove yourself. Turn this, turn this lamp on. Move this dish across the table. God's already told us what he wants us to do. He's already told us who he is. God's already told us how to live. He's already told us not to be afraid. He's already told us that he would protect us. He's already told us that he would provide for us. But when life goes a little off course, goes a little awry, we are tempted to complain to him about the circumstance of our life, and we doubt the road we're on. Just like the Israelites who wandered in the desert. God, are you with us or not? We are tempted to question God's plan when it doesn't go the way we like. We are tempted to doubt that he loves us when things go wrong. We are tempted to ask for signs that he's even still with us. We say, show us that your presence is real. When he's already proven himself to you over and over and over and over again. God says, I'm with you. God says, I'll never leave you. God says, I'll never forsake you. But we still ask, God, are you there? And if you are, prove it. God says, I'll always protect you. I'll always have your best interests at heart. And we say, okay, but just in case, I'm going to wear this medieval suit of armor with me wherever I go. God told the Israelites, I'll feed you. I'll feed you every single day. Don't worry. And they said, uh-huh, we believe you. But just in case, we're going to take this food and we're going to hide it until tomorrow, just in case you don't come through for us. Do you see this doubt? This questioning? And why that would make God angry? This is why the proverb says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Was Jesus tempted another way? Yes. Jesus was tempted to exalt himself and to bring himself glory. The devil said, if you are the son of God, then claim it. Claim that title. Be that king. Sit on that throne. Wield power. Don't earn people's respect with love. Take it by force. That's what the snake told Eve. Take it, right? The snake told Eve if they ate the apple, they would be like God. It was a sin to exalt yourself. The sin to kick God off the throne and to sit in his chair. The sin of idolatry. But see, the role of Adam and Eve was to worship God, not to be God. And our temptation is no different. Every day, we are tempted to either put someone else or something else on God's throne. You see, again, the devil takes something that is a natural desire. And in this case, it's pride. There is no sin in being proud. There is no sin in having people be proud of you. But it's when we seek pride outside of God's plan that we sin. We say, I'm going to attain what I want, and I'm going to attain it the way I want. This is my plan. This is about my pleasure. This is about my pursuits, my possessions. And if right now while I'm talking, you think to yourself, well, <laughs> I don't struggle with pride, that sounds like you're pretty proud of that fact. 
We all struggle with pride. Here in Matthew 4, Jesus is tempted with self-gratification, self-protection, and self-exaltation. And yes, it looks very different in our lives. But the fact is, those temptations are still in our lives, even now, in 2022. So back to my question. How does the temptation of Jesus relate to me? Jesus was tempted, and he was victorious. In every way that I am tempted, Jesus was tempted, but yet he was victorious. How? What advice can I give you? First, I would say do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Remember, we said the devil is the creator of fear. Most people find temptation and the idea of it depressing or discouraging, and they feel like, well, I'm being tempted, so I must be bad. Being tempted doesn't mean you're bad. Jesus was tempted. He wasn't bad. The Bible says he was without sin. No, the real reason that you are being tempted in the first place is because you have an enemy that is bent on your destruction. Remember, fear is a tactic the devil uses against you. Deuteronomy 31 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Second piece of advice I can give you is believe the Bible. Believe it. You know, the devil was right. Jesus had the power to turn rocks into bread. But you know what we forget? He was also God, which means Jesus had the power to turn the devil into a rock. But instead, Jesus used the same tool to fight temptation that you have, the Word of God. You see, the reason why we can identify with Christ is because he fights temptation as a human. He didn't fight temptation as God in those moments. As a man, he was showing us that we too can be victorious over temptation. But listen, winning against a spiritual war and being triumphant is not the same as winning at your New Year's resolution. Most of the time, in a New Year's resolution, we're giving something up or we're trying something new. And those boil down to your determination. You know, they, they boil down to your willpower. Do I have the willpower to exercise every morning? Do I have the willpower to stay on this diet? You cannot defeat the powers of darkness by willpower. Good intentions are not enough. And if you're losing the battle against temptation, it's because willpower isn't going to cut it. None of us, not even me, have a strong enough will. You think being a pastor exempts me from being tempted? I am no different than you. I am prone to sin at every point in my life. My mind is just as susceptible to wandering, and I am just as susceptible to thinking horrible thoughts just like you. I am tempted by the flesh in my personal life. I am tempted by pride in my career. I am tempted to lie to make myself look good. And I am tempted to tear other people down to make myself look better. I am just as tempted to judge people by their appearances. I am tempted to be skeptical, hypocritical, and I am tempted to put my own needs above others. Believe me, you and I are tempted equally. The only difference between me, you, is one wrong look from me, one inappropriate encounter, one hasty choice could wreck all kinds of havoc on my life, my family, this church, and it would bring disgrace to God. So willpower isn't enough. How do I know? Because willpower wasn't enough for Jesus. Right? So it's not enough for you. 
Jesus fought the power of darkness with the Bible. With being able to recall verses from the Word of God because he believed them. He stood on them like foundation. He wielded them like tools. And Jesus wasn't afraid of the powers of darkness because he had the Bible. Stop reading the things that scare you and divide you. Stop reading the things that lie to you. Stop reading the things that tell you to protect yourself or to exalt yourself. That is not God's will for your life. And start reading and start believing the precious Word of God. If you're going to make any New Year's resolution this year, it would be to win against temptation with the Word, by knowing and believing the Word. His will for your life is right there in the Scriptures. That is where truth is found. That is where His will for you is found. That's how we win. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. Once again, from the pages of Jesus, his life is truly the example that we all should follow. Thank you for his example. Thank you for his precious gift. As we walk through the pages of Matthew, may they be new to us with every reading. May they enlighten us, embolden us. May they equip us for all good things. May we win the war against temptation in our own lives. May we put those struggles behind us. May we step foot onto the road of life that leads towards light, that leads toward you, towards your will and your perfect grace. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. We're always here, but of course, we'd love for you to be here. Uh, we have two services every single Sunday, one at 9.30. In traditional service, we have a choir. And we also have an 11 o'clock service. It's more contemporary. We have a worship team. And during that hour, we also have a children's program and we have youth group. We also have a youth group that meets every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And it is for middle school and high school students. You can send your 7th through 12th grader to us each Wednesday. We have a program for them. And We'll even feed them dinner. We'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.